as well, because we, you might assume that video games get history right, and they very often don't. But the context games are played it in is absolutely critical, and that's why I argue it's not a magic circle, it's a contextual space in which we play games in. That context is not necessarily locked away from the other people in our world. There's got to be people in here who play online with other people. I'm hoping, because that's kind of a conventional way of doing things now. I think it's really difficult to argue that's a magic circle. Because it's much more porous and osmotic. You know, do you know what I mean by osmotic? Like things enter and leave a sort of bubble. Than, um, than just having a magic circle where play occurs here. It's actually, you know, play is distributed. People come and go into the play environment, but also the environment that we're in interrupts what we're doing for play, you know. Um, so the idea of it being very discreet, I think, is massively problematic. For Wittgenstein, it was really important in the history of Swansea University, Ludwig Wittgenstein. Uh, Ludwig Ludwig Wittgenstein taught at Swansea University in 1948, which is pretty cool. One of the most important philosophers of all time. Uh, no common definition for games. All we have are resemblances between games. There is no such thing as this is a game. There are lots of different games which resemble one another, but you can't say there's a classical thing for games. So. Why do I invoke Wittgenstein here? Well, when we're thinking about the games that we play, don't have this top level thing, this is a game, it does X, Y, and Z, because the games that we play are much better understood as belonging in a relationship with other games themselves, where there is influence in terms of rules and influence in terms of outcomes and influence in terms of how it looks and what it plays like. These are important. So I'm just talking about Cyberpunk 2077. It's like when I'm playing that game, I don't enter that world dry. <laughs> you know, I, that is, you know, I, this like I have played games for more than 30 years. I have I, there's a context in which that game already fits in. For me, it is a really poor ripoff of the game mechanics that Rockstar have been doing for 20 years and they've just transposed it into a different kind of environment. And they haven't got it right because they've missed out on what the fun is with those open world games by Rockstar. You know, there is, there's genuinely fun things to do in those worlds. The big problem with Cyberpunk 2077 is it's not fun to play. You don't do fun things. You just kind of grind right from the outset. And it's like, I don't want to do this. Like, you know, show me something funny. Show me, you know, dog taking a shit or something like that because that's funny right you know show me you know give me the chance to you know throw a piece of c4 onto a prostitute and blow her up that's funny just have to rely on doing that in everyday life instead which is more problematic and you know there's a whole thing and i don't want to get into it um Jay McConnell is a really important theorist. Um, I think I've put this book in the reading uh, for it. Another book uh, which is really, really easy to read. If you sat down with it, you'd be halfway through it within an hour. Um, she's a really important theorist, but also a game maker. And Reality is Broken um, has a lot of interesting things to say about games itself. Her argument about games really is that you c games are one of the most fundamental ways that you can improve people's psychological well-being. If you factor in psychological well-being into the game experience itself, you can have positive outcomes. And this really resonates with what we were saying earlier about the function of games, that they make you feel a certain way. They improve. A good game will improve your mood. It will make you happy. You will be happy to play it. So, um, and moreover, McGonagall argues that, that um, you can facilitate community. I mean, she doesn't, she's not necessarily just talking about co-play here, although that is an important point, but also community itself can be fostered in paratextual ways. 
So we play the same games as one another. We have a point by which we can communicate with one another about something, which can in itself create communities. There's no surprise she's writing this in 2011 when you start to see the emergence of game culture and um, gaming communities online, which are not necessarily related to play online, but in, instead related to discussing games in particular ways. So, there is a way of thinking about games in a really positive fashion. In that sense, going forward from McGonagall's arguments that play and games can bleed into our everyday lives and improve life, we see the emergence of a new framework for thinking about <coughs> how games affect us and it affects everyday life. This is called Ludo Literacy. So, Ewan Rassens is probably the most important person in this, although, albeit he's not, certainly not the only person who talks about this stuff. Now, for Rassens, play has been appropriated by media studies as a way to understand culture itself. It's just, it's been done in a way that we don't really think about it. But media studies as an entire subject is now a subject about play. That what we do and how we consume, and indeed, where Rassens starts with this is the uses and gratifications model for audience behaviour, which emerged in the 1960s. It's like that is fundamentally arguing that we use things in order to make ourselves feel better. That's fundamentally what a game is for. Games do that. Therefore, media studies is doing this, it's just we don't realise we're doing it. Which is why I started to with like, I should be doing this for the first years, not for you guys in the third year. Because it is now a fundamental thing. He described this framework as ludo-literacy. That actually there is a ludification of culture that's been happening since really the post-war era. But it's become more intense uh, during the digital era. For Ian Bogost, games are models of experience, not textual descriptions of an experience. I'm running through all these ideas really fast because they're all stuff that you can use. But let's pause for a second and think about that. A game is not a textual description of an experience. It's not, you know, this is how it is. Instead, it is a model. Why do you think that's an important distinction? Well, by the sense that it's not a textual description, I mean, every, every person's experience of games is different than the other person's. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Couldn't have put it back myself. A textual description of an experience would be an objective description of an experience. In essence, we would all experience the same thing at the same time as one another if this was the case. That simply doesn't happen. Instead, games are more, as Ian says, they're a model. We fit into that model, but we bring with us a past. We also bring with us a future, a projection of what we want from doing that thing at that point in time. So therefore, what we have is subjective experience of that game rather than an objective experience. Something which would be like just a textual description of something. It would be, you know, we don't have the ability to change the parameters of how we're going to experience that thing because it is laid out for us in a particular way. Instead, if we think of games as models which allow us to do particular things within a set of rules, but allow us to do them in different ways to one another, then we are much more akin. Because as you say, yeah, games are different for different people. What you enjoy, I won't. Mm -hmm. We're doing the same thing. We're engaged in the same activity. But I won't enjoy parts of that. I'm primarily really a retro gamer. What I find really interesting about that is people of your generation, it's, I don't know if you guys like retro games, and I'm not sure, but I know one thing, you're fucking terrible at them. Because, and there's a real reason for this, they ask you to do very different things than the stuff that you're used to with games. Controversial, I think games these days are incredibly easy. You know, you can play through anything, basically. There's nothing really that, okay, some 
things which are really bonkers like Dark Souls, they just make that really hard for no reason. Like, I'm not sure what the hell they're trying to prove there. But most games these days are not meant to be hard. They're meant to, to pull you all the way through. It blows my mind when you look at trophy stats for things, and like only 30% of people have finished Red Dead Redemption 2 on PlayStation. If you get a trophy for finishing, and I, you, know, you can check you know, how many people have got this trophy, and it's about 30%. It's like, I know it takes a while, because it's a really long-ass game, but it, it ain't hard. You, you just got to go and keep on going with it. So it only tells me perhaps people got really bored with it halfway through or something like that. You know, same with um, <coughs> the thing. I, I, I finished something and I looked at the stats for it and it was like, it just blew me away. It was like 10% of people who finished this game. And it was like, this, really? This is not difficult. Whereas retro games are incredibly difficult because they rely on timing and reflexes, which games now just don't do. Unfortunately. I said, do you think though that's also the way gaming is now has completely changed? Like, I remember when I first started gaming, I had a game on a disc, <laughs> and if I didn't want to play that game, like you kept pushing because it was your only game to play. Whereas now, I can reach a point. I've tried to kill this thing seven times. I think, fuck it, I'm gonna go and play something else that's yeah. on PlayStation Plus. It's free. I, I think I, I think that is a very very important point. The uh, distribution and availability of games now has changed the way that we look at them. Again, to extrapolate from that example, um, and some of you did this in the handbook, where you picked <laughs> out the thing that I asked you to do at the end of the handbook and actually sent me the thing. Not you, Cheska, of course, because it's just beneath you, I know. But um, <laughs> that game that I asked people to find something for in the handbook is one of the most difficult video games you could ever play. There is one section, and it's not even on the final level, although the final level is staggeringly hard, but there's a section on the level before the final level which is almost impossible to play through. It, it, there is a series of jumps you have to do where, it, I'm not kidding, if you don't get it pixel perfect right, you'll never make it. It's amazing. I love it. It's, it's an absolute brilliant. I could play that game all day, and it is really frustrating, and it is really hard, and it makes me want to cry, but it's great. <laughs> it's, 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 you know, it, it really is fantastic. Like, you know? But that's my upbringing in games. That's, got, you know, I, that's what games were like for me when I was a kid. And again, I bought that game. It was £35 mm. in 1990. You <coughs> extrapolate that out for inflation today. That's over 100 quid. Uh, I didn't have thirty-five pounds in nineteen. I don't even know where I got that money from. I probably jacked a sweet shop or something. I can't remember how I got it. So yeah, uh, you know, you, you made the most of what you had. What were you gonna say, Cheska? It's like, did you ever play the Legend of Zelda games? A lot, yeah. Because it's a lot of it's like puzzle and yeah. stuff, and like I, I really like it, and I still replay like the old ones, and um, I still have to Google like how to complete a puzzle. But like we have the ability to go like Google it. There were no Google cruise. when I was doing <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. had um, you had magazines. Yeah, or you just give yeah, up. Yeah, you know, I mean, there were magazines, but um, they didn't do sort of playthroughs. You oh. you might get cheats of them, but not playthroughs of things. Well, they also show it in the manual as well. In some games as well. In some, in yeah. some, yeah. Who read the manual? Uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, it's uh, yeah, it's um, it's weird to me that that happens. Okay, so this is an idea I'm going to build on next week: procedural rhetoric. But when we play, we appropriate these models, and our actions are constrained by their rules. This is what Ian Bogus calls procedural rhetoric. Within every game, there is a persuasion going on. You enter a model of how to do things, and then you execute it in your own way. But what we don't realise when we're playing a game is that we are acting in that way. That we are picking up on these are the rules on how to do it and we are executing them according to the rules that we have set forward. So, I mean, your Zelda games, there is a, there is a way of playing Zelda. You might not realise it, but you are being conditioned ostensibly by the game itself to play it in a particular way and if you step outside those rules of playing it you won't be successful 
is almost like you need a, a, not just a way of moving the character, but also a way of thinking about progress. You know, that I know there's going to be this puzzle coming up shortly. I know what the puzzles have been in the past, so it gives you some clues as to what's coming. But then it will subtly mess with those, so you're left in the situation where you have to Google how to do it. Um, a set of breadcrumbs. But then, then that is, it's like, ostensibly, there is a Zelda in. I think the most successful series in terms of how you can trace procedural rhetoric is the Mario series. Where really, the rules of what you need to do haven't changed that much in nearly 40 years. You know, it, it's the same kind of thing that you do. Sure, it looks much better than it used to. Does it play any better? I, I'm not convinced by that because if we look at like Super Mario 3, that's probably still one of the best games of all time and plays incredibly well still. But there are a set of rules that we start to execute in the game that we're not aware of. We are, if you like, conditioned into doing things in particular ways, which is beyond what we're asked to do. And this is really true for all games. And this becomes really important next week, but it's another way of thinking. And I think the notion of procedural rhetoric is something really important to bring out in the videos that you do. But what is the game asking me to do? What is it telling me that I need to do in order to make progress here? Or in order to get this goal? If you start to pull yourself back from the experience of playing it at that point and start to unpick what the game is asking you for, you will understand that there is a set, there is a logic at play here, which is make, if you like, making you engage in a particular way. I've mentioned Katie Salem and Eric Zimmerman previously. <clears throat> for them, games are systems. They're narrative mediums, sites of social play, and sites of cultural resistance. That last point is something important. The idea of a game being a site of cultural resistance is very important in itself. Games, this is, develops Salem and Zimmerman's sort of development of his Inga, that you know, games are separate. And within that separateness, it doesn't mean necessarily that they're bad things, that they are ways that you can express you know, resistance to the primary cultures in which you're in all the time. It's a bit like my murder sprees in Red Dead Redemption 2, right? I can't do that. I, I would really like to do that in everyday life, but I can't go out and just murder a family. Because of rules. Right? There's a whole bunch of things that say, I mean, my neighbour's two doors up, I'm itching. I kid you not, right? But <clears throat> I can't do it, so I do it in the game instead. It's, you know, and as a, as in a way, that's a cultural resistance, it's a psychotic cultural resistance, but it's cultural resistance nevertheless. For this, then, for Salem and Cinnamon, where they draw away from Huizinga a little, rules and play and culture are intrinsically linked to one another. And their point about rules, therefore, becomes important. The rules of games, which we play all the time, become a way in which we understand the rules of everyday life. The roots of what we call gamification are through how we play games and how then we conceptualise what goes on in everyday life as a game of a sort. That we have to play. We ha and I'm going to ask you to think about this in a little while. And I'm going to blow you away. I, uh, not like I'm doing Red Dead Redemption, but I'm, I, do, I will get you to reconsider everything that you have done with your life up to this point. But one or two of you in this room are smart enough to know what I'm already talking about, and I'm going to put it up on the fucking screen. So you're going to steal my thunder. Game is a system in which players engage in an artificial conflict defined by rules which results in a, qualifiable, a quantifiable outcome. This is a fairly familiar approach. Now for Yes for Yule, um, game is a rule-based formal system with a variable and quantifiable outcome, so just like Salem and Zimmerman. Different outcomes uh, assign different values and the player exerts effort in order to influence the outcome. The player feels attached to the outcome and the consequences of the activity are optional and negotiable. It's a very complete definition of what a game is, but it still laces a lot of these uh, ideas from previous ones as well. I don't think it's very useful. <laughs> uh, very much uh, in digital games, rules come from a computer and not from any form of negotiation. One of the things that you will ignores, I think, is that we're not in a, in a negotiation with a digital game. It's given to us. 
we, there isn't a person that we're negotiating on outcomes with. It, it is a given. It has been programmed in a particular way. And gameplay is therefore the subjective experience of those rules. Chris Crawford is a game designer, says there's four features common to all games, representation, interaction, conflict, and safety. These are things that you might well want to reflect on. For Marshall McLuhan, games are not separate from culture, but a reflection of that culture. Extensions of the social man and the body politic. Games, importantly for McLuhan, their function is to release tension. The cathartic model of gaming. We play to relax. And it's tied to which in the culture which they say exists, which effectively makes games as a catharsis. I think McLuhan, like, obviously you guys all know I found by McLuhan in a big way, right? But I think this idea of games as a reflection of culture is incredibly important. The games that we play, and importantly the games that get developed for us to play, are a reflection of the culture in which we exist. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Think about the thing that you're playing right now. Let's do a round table here. Dan, what are you playing? What is in, uh, uh, Overwatch 2. Overwatch 2. Do you think Overwatch 2 is a reflection of wider culture? No. Why not? Um. Sorry for putting you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Let's think about it. Modern warfare. What are you asked to do? Well, kill. Kill. I'm all for it. Um, in what context? Well, for the greater good, I guess. Feel like that. And does this resonate with anything else that happens within our culture? Yeah, not, not, to, the, not to the extent that we should show. Oh, it's it's okay. Yeah, well, I don't know. Go on TikTok and search for Ukraine and see what comes up. I'm not sure about that. I think the emergence of hyper-realistic war games in really the 2000s, right? reflect a really bizarre transformation in culture after September the 11th where you could be anti-war but you can't be anti-troops and this is a deeply embedded idea not just in American society but also in our society as well you can disagree with the reason why say Britain goes to war with another country but you can't be anti-troops they're heroes. We have charities for them now, which is kind of bonkers. It's like these are civil servants at the end of the day. The government should look after them, but they don't. Um, and you can't express really ideas. It's, you know, like when I was a kid, like people who joined the army were not respected because you were a loser. <laughs> I mean, you were a massive loser if you joined the army. It's like, well, zero GCSEs, right? Okay. Um, and, and, you know, and, and that was a reflection of culture in the 90s. We, that level of respect for that kind of thing didn't <coughs> exist. However, we live in a, what is called a very militaristic society now. You only have to look to the, the events of the Queen's funeral. You, you not notice that everyone was wearing military outfits? People who, believe me, have never served in the military either. With, like medals all across them. It's, what did you get a medal for? Dandruff? Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a, we, it's not just the United We kind of like to point to things and say, oh, that's an American problem. It certainly isn't. It's, a, it's something which actually most of Western culture has embodied since um, September the 11th. It's the emergence of militarism. And I don't think it's any um, coincidence here that actually military strategy games were a really niche part of the market until the mid-2000s. And now they're blockbusters, now they're huge. Um, 
because they reflect the kind of positioning of the military and people in the military in our wider society. I don't, I don't think that these things are accidental in any way, shape or form. I think it's a really good example, actually. Morgan, what are you going to say? Yeah, I mean, I'm playing a game right now which has like historical references, so it's tied to like the culture of the 1950s in a way. So I'm playing Fallout what 4. What is the Fallout 4? Fallout right? 4. In the beginning of Fallout 4, you start off before before the bombs fell, and the setting you start up in a house. You you're, you either play as a male or a female, and you live in this picturesque house and like which is like has like a 50 setting. So it's like an old TV. You've got like loads of consumerism available. Um, <laughs> there's Not the, the Red Scare is re referenced as well. Of course. Um, you've got like similar clothing, hairstyles, uh, the cars, and then even after the bombs, when the bombs fall, it's still there, but in a more wider contest because you were not bound. You were you start off in that house, but as, as the bombs fell and you get out of the vault, you see the rest of the world as well. And you see, especially when you go to the city as well, you see like all the adverts for like, um, like old 50s like adverts for like Nuka-Cola and like, you know, the supermarket and stuff like that. Which, so it's very much like a lot of relevances to like the 1950s and the 60s, so it's like um, consumerism and capitalism. <coughs> sure. Yeah. One of the problematic aspects with things like Fallout 4 is the idea that you could survive. Yeah. This is going to be eerily reminiscent of what's going on. Now. We know that Vladimir Putin is threatening Ukraine with that. a tactical nuclear weapon, right? Now, I thought those days were over. Because I, you know, I was a kid in the 80s where literally you had two sides of the world aiming thousands of these things at one another and it could have gone at any point. When I was five, I remember doing a nuclear, um, you know, nuclear bomb preparation lesson in primary school where we were asked to go under the desks. Like, that would have made any fucking difference if a nuclear bomb had gone off. And that's my wider point here. Fallout 4 replicates an idea of nuclear war, which simply isn't true, that we would somehow survive. Now, I, don't, I don't want you all to be unduly frightened, but if it did kick off nuclear style, given where we are, we're not surviving. No. There, there, there's a bomb aimed at Swansea. Okay. We're gone. There's, there's no vaults as well. So <laughs> there is, can't go well, there, there isn't anywhere. There, well, there is nowhere to hide from something like that anyway. The idea that you can go underground and, like, you will be fine. You can't. No, th that doesn't work either. So, you know, it, all of life, if you did manage somehow to survive the blast, you'd be dead within six months. At most. You wouldn't be for years wandering the way the way You wouldn't like, be a ghoul. Like, no, exactly. No. The idea of survivalism of nuclear holocaust is an ideological idea. It's weirdly mainly a Western idea because when kids in the Soviet Union and people in the Soviet Union were conceptualizing uh, nuclear war, they didn't have this idea that anyone would survive. They, they thought that would be it. They were kind of more realistic about things. But the idea of survivalism really comes from American culture of the 50s and 60s. They're like, if it goes off, if it all goes off, you know, America will persevere. America is stronger than annihilation. No, it's not. Yeah. It, it was, no, you weren't surviving anything. Nobody was surviving that. So um, th that whole idea is, if you like, an ideological construct about how, you know, resilient democracy can be in the face of total annihilation. Spoiler, it ain't. <laughs> and certainly the one thing, if there was a survivor community, the last thing that would happen is democracy. It would be it, far from democracy, I can assure you. As a reflection of culture, that kind of game works kind of ideally, because it is, I, I know Fallout and the way that they develop those games is as a, you know, a very satirical reflection on particular cultures 
And I, you know, I'm sure there's a satirical edge to what they do in here with regards to survivorism. Mm -hmm. But survivorism itself is a notion built into Western cultures that we will survive anything. Spoiler, we won't. That's not going to happen. And it's kind of grim. I, I, I never actually thought ever again there would be some idiot somewhere in the world threatening to do this. I thought, finally, that had ended. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's, it's kind of deeply upsetting in a lot of ways that you know, there's still people who think, yeah, we can use weapons like this. Um, <clears throat> to bring another voice into this, games are fixed, finite and goal-oriented. Do you see the repetition emerging here now? Um, for Boker and Star, I, th I think this is kind of interesting. Games as boundaries is a really interesting way of putting it. It's not necessarily the magic circle we're talking about here, but there are adaptive or plastic areas across individual contexts, but the game itself is coherent. So it doesn't matter where it's played and where it's enacted, but there's something recognisable and coherent about the game itself, which means it can occur across different contexts. So the variations to this could include the different platform, the software, the hardware, the network, whether it's domestic or at work, um, how it's performed legally, socially, personally, and epistemologically, how it's performed in terms of different knowledge structures that we have about games. That idea of game as a boundary is quite interesting to me. That it's not something as solid as, I'm playing a game so I'm creating a bubble here. Instead, when I'm playing a game, I'm taking the game with me and I'm enacting it in a particular way, but the context in which I can do it is different all the time. Do you all have specific game spaces? Like, you, you know, there's a, there's a place and that's where you play. Mm -hmm. Does anyone not? Eve, you probably don't because you're not, you're just not into this. But, um, <laughs> in any way, shape or form. <laughs> but, I mean, I kind of do. Uh, well, I'm playing a mobile game. So you nice. can do that sort of anywhere. That would be my point. It preempted me completely. Yeah. What are you playing? Uh, Clash of Clans. I, uh, it's another one of these things that I've had a million adverts for over the years, right? But I've never actually played. Is it any good? I like it. I've played it since I was quite young, so. You, and you've kept with it all the way through. Well, there's been times where you go a couple of years without playing it, and then you I, come I back get that to with it. some things. Yeah, but um, yeah, I tend to be consistent with these things. But yeah, perfect. That you, you take that with you. Yeah, it's yeah. always on your phone. So. And it's contextually different where you play it in different places as well. Um, my, most of my mobile games are like bus-based because it's something to do in that environment, which means that when inevitably the psychopath comes and sits next to me and wants to engage me on you know, debate about the Incas, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing something different. And I've created this kind of boundary, but it's not a bubble in which the world doesn't you know, it, it, it's, the world exists, you know, I can smell people on the bus, you know, and grim is, is the word I would use. The bus I was on a Saturday morning, man, holy shit. But um, <clears throat> why is it that everyone who's going to Morriston has to stink? Um, but I think, it's a, I think that kind of fits into you. I think you can see where I'm going with the rest of this lecture now as well. Because it is mobile gaming that I think actually disturbs a lot of these rules um, most coherently. Does anyone know Sid Myers? Who is he? Guy who made the <coughs> Civilization game series. He did indeed. Um, wrote a really interesting book called Sid Meier's Memoir. Not an interesting title, <laughs> but um, it's a very interesting book. For Sid, a game can simply be described as a series of interesting choices. The key word here being choices. We are offered things to do. We are pushed stuff to do. This is how he conceptualises civilization itself as a series. I will give you choices to make. You can make whatever choices you want, but you, I'm giving them to you. Because that's my role, that's his role as a game designer, effectively, is to make those choices available. And if we think of games in that sense, that whatever we do, we're giving choices to make, even in like really fundamental basic games like tic-tac-toe, we have choices, but those choices are defined by the rules of the game. You can't put a cross outside of the grid. That would be weird. You wouldn't be allowed to play any longer. 
you would be shunned in the community. You know, I always see this with people who do um, rock, paper, scissors, right? And they want to do rock, paper, scissors, and then they add some other... No. It works on its own fundamental basis. You do not add bits to it. There is not a fourth choice. Very recent piece of research. Um, Sarah Grimes, this is another excellent book. Called, it's, the book is called Digital Playgrounds. Um, Sarah Grimes is primarily interested in these open worlds which have developed over the past few years, in particular Minecraft and Roblox. Uh, children's play spaces online and what those game environments mean for children that engage with them. Now, she emphasizes creativity in a big way, but she also says that these are fundamentally massively exploitative spaces. Where Does anyone use Roblox? You do? No, I don't, but my sister is addicted to it. How old's your sister? 13. She's in the wheelhouse for it, okay. Uh, what does she do? Right, so she's addicted to this like game, which is like The Sims, mm. and she has spent years on that. And she, she showed, I was watching her play the other day, she showed me her build, because you could build houses in this game. And I was very, very impressed. She built this massive mansion, very, very detailed. Can she like, sell it? Does she sell it? No. Can she sell it? <laughs> can, yeah, she can sell it, yeah. Okay, that, that, no, that's, that's interesting. She doesn't want to because it's so good. Uh, brilliant. Ah. Um, it, it creates open a huge market. Now, if she did decide to sell that property in Roblox, she would be rewarded for it, but Roblox themselves would take a massive slice of what she got for it. Yep. What is Roblox there for? A company that has made billions of the labour of children. And don't confuse what that means. Yeah. Child labour is not good. <laughs> Unpaid child, la child labour is even worse, I would argue. Um, that's why it's exploited <laughs> in an extreme way. But the important thing in terms of thinking as a, as a game is, I think, grounded in what Morgan's just described. We can build you can make parts of it your own. Some of the games that we play, and one of the reasons why we do play them, is the ability to customise our experience and to manipulate the game itself into being something that we have a part of. This can happen in weird ways with lots of things. You know, from purchasing something for your avatar to finding an item I'll use Red Dead Redemption 2 again. I had a horse. I, 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 the one horse that I used through that game, I used all the way through the game. It was the one you get right at the beginning. It's a crappy horse. I mean, there are a lot better horses in it, but it's my horse. <laughs> you know, it's, that's my horse. Like, you know, get off my horse. <laughs> it's not my horse. It's a bunch of pixels. It's not. It's not a real thing. It's, you know, I have my gun. It's not a gun. It doesn't exist. It's immaterial. It's just a thing that in the environment, you know, my hat. It must be your hat, dude. It doesn't exist. One of the ways the Grimes conceptualizes Minecraft in particular and why it's so popular. And you know, we're talking about the, you know, the biggest selling video game of all time, um, and. Probably the, to an extent, the most successful monetization of a video game environment in history. Why is it so popular? Because as a game, it allows us to invest. When our time and energy is put into that, we have something tangible, even though it's immaterial. It feels ours afterwards. I, somebody sent me um, or tweeted me. Uh, with a video of somebody in Minecraft who set up a Minecraft server and had allowed some other people to build things on their Minecraft server. He set aside a space where he was going to make a farm and somebody made Auschwitz. Oh my god. <laughs> I think I've seen I'm, that. I'm, I'm like looking at this and I was like, 
Oh my god, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. But this guy was laughing his head off. <laughs> he done it as a joke, and it was like, this is the, this is the. I can get close to the bone, but that is beyond me. Well, right? I, you do yeah. not make a concentration camp for a joke. But it had like furnaces, and you know, oh, I, I think labeled I've seen gas video. chambers yeah. and things like that. It was like, oh, it's all right. Wow. Yeah, if you if you Google um, yeah. Minecraft Auschwitz, it will come up. It's, uh, it's on YouTube, right? Um, when I watched it, the, the funniest bit of it, it is funny because the guy is just screaming, laughing at this bloke because this bloke is just going, but I wanted to build a farm and you've made Auschwitz and I'm Jewish. <laughs> and it's just like, it's just kind of grim. Um, now, to tap into what you were saying, the concept here at play is uh, ambient play. This is a concept that comes from Marissa Hall and Ingrid Richardson. In mobile games in particular, we engage in ambient play, but what I would encourage you to do is think about the ambience of play for all types of gaming, not just mobile games. Now, Larissa and Ingrid are personally interested in mobile games. They're probably the two leading scholars on mobile games that there are. Um, and because of that, their work is very much focused on mobility. But I think that what they talk about in terms of ambient gaming is applicable to all our gaming practices. So for Larissa and Ingrid, modes of play switch between the foreground and the background of an environment. That's their key takeaway point. When we play, we're always in a movement between the environment that we're in and the game that we're in. It is not locked out. We're in fact always moving between those two We've used terms like worlds and environments and so on, okay, but if you're in a constant flux between the two of them, that means that they're not separate from one another, they coexist with one another. The atmosphere of doing this, yeah, we, we are moving between, it's, it's like being in this lecture, right? Some points you're listening, and some points you're fucking not. You are moving between two different ways of engagement. And importantly then, our experience of space itself is always transformed when we play games. When, we, so when you're playing Clash of Clans, you're not for a second, then you play and there's that transformational aspect of what's going on in terms of our spatiality itself, how we appreciate and how we find, you know, we find ourselves embodied in different spaces is always transformed by these things. So the term ambient here refers to games and playful media practices pervade our social and communicative ter terrain. And as we live in a touchscreen world, proprioception, I can't believe I said that word right first time, proprioception, we are engaging the world through touch, that's what proprioception actually means. So basically we have a series of continuums here between play at home, the magic circle and urban play, and they're always being broken down and reformed at all times. Play itself isn't just centred on our gaming chair and our PC setup, it is everywhere. We are engaging with it all the time. So mobile games in particular are entangled in everyday life. Uh, they combine physical place and online networked information. Uh, we're not aware of these connections being made, but they are being made at all times. Now, it's not just um, Ingrid and Larissa who talk about this for Miguel Sica. Playfulness is the contemporary attitude across all facets of life. For use to arsons, ludification of culture, play is everywhere, the body and the environment are co-constituted through the affordances of our technologies and therefore play is a very important part of how we embody the world itself. Um, for Brendan Keogh, games are part of the corporeal perception of a knowing playing body. What he means there is the way that we play and the way that we engage with games actually becomes a part of how we engage with the world itself. It becomes part of our knowledge base of how we engage with everything. And games are multi-sensual as well. And in that sense, when we play, we engage our senses in particular ways, and we take that sensual engage engagement forward with us for what we're doing in other places. Um, and video games, therefore, are a direct challenge uh, to the spatiality of play, and that thinking that play itself is you know, discrete. It is spatially discrete from things. Games are often played outside the fine spaces, for example, something like Pokemon Go. I'm shamelessly cited my own research on Pokemon Go there because you're allowed to do that. And 
you've got published research, right? Go away and read the fucking paper. Um, and what Mike and I argued in that paper is that when people play Pokemon Go, they're actually recalibrating the way that they move through urban spaces. The, the logic of the game itself means that they experience urban space in a very different way, and how you actually move through urban spaces is recalibrated by playing the game itself as well. The games are responsible, therefore, for making and remaking space itself. And these are ideas which simply are not covered in those classical theories of play. Classical theory of play would say, no, Pokemon Go player, oh, magic circle around them. They're playing and it's separate from the world. That simply doesn't make sense. It makes absolutely no sense. And I'd say even for a Clash of Clans player, I'd argue that's the case. That you are playing it and changing the world around you at that point in time, but you are out there. You, this is not a discrete activity in any way. So, that's the argument we make. That's me playing Pokemon Go. Uh, that intersection of life and play going on here. In the very depressing town, Hastings. <laughs> this process of games interrupting the world itself is called gamification. Before we go any further, I want you to try and think of this. Can you think of any circumstances where game logic has been part of your everyday activities? Do it quick. <laughs> we ain't got much time because, you know, time is illusory for me as always. <laughs> <laughs> I am the main slides to go through. Your facial expressions are so emotive. Jessica's <laughs> 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 struggling with this one. <laughs> I can't use it. Everyone's looking at this like, whoa. You're all probably too thinking at too high a level here. There are obvious things. Nice. This one works. I think that's a good, a good answer, to be honest. That's where I'm going. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> I don't know if you've played the two. Um, yeah. It's much easier to bluff online. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I do want to finish up. Because, like, I, I need to get up. This, this is typical of the first few weeks of being back. It's not my time is fucking all over the place, right? But, anyway. This, uh, there's, there's some answers here which are really interesting. I, Jordan, that's a really, really good answer, by the way, about gamification. It used to stress me out. Why? Because obviously, like, people can see, like, your score and stuff, then, like, yeah. And you blow. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, nah. <laughs> well, that's wrong. Um, Jess's answer here. Morgan's, I don't know what that app is called, but there were, know, a, there were a bunch of them for a long time where yeah. you could, um, you know, brushing your teeth and doing this kind of thing was quantified in particular ways, and then you got a score at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come back to what that means, and something actually that you all should be doing now, which you're not, weirdly. I'll come back in a second. Jess's answer here is really good, because the notion of doing things in order to be rewarded... I, I got promoted here a couple of years ago, right, from senior lecturer to associate professor. In order to get that promotion, I basically had a tick list. Have you done this, 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 and this? It's a game. You have to evidence that you've done those things. You are all going into this world pretty soon. Right? Really soon. In fact, this time next year, you'll be in it. You better get used to playing the game. So a gamifying achievement in that way is a big thing. There are a ton of things like this. Now, I'm really bad at languages. 
it's, it's just, I'm not wired for them. I was never, wasn't that good in school, unfortunately, with languages. But I have been trying the last few years to learn Welsh, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay. Um, I used to be able to speak it when I was a kid, and I've forgotten, basically, so I'm, I'm doing all right. I use Duolingo. Anyone ever use this app? Mm -hmm. It's a game. It's, it's not really a language learning app at all. You earn points per day to be on a league table against others. It's a competitive, gamified environment. You are taking the objective of learning a language and turning it into a game in order to accumulate achievement. Now, the thing that I wanted to raise here was, this was supposed to happen this year, and for some reason the university haven't done it. I think I know why they haven't done it as well. The person who was behind it has left. Not because they were bad, they've gone to a better job. Um, we were going to launch a student dashboard. Does anyone have any idea what that means? Is it like okay. a forum or something? No. Nope. It would be an app. Results? Hmm? Was it a way of comparing results almost? Not just comparing results, although that would be achievable. Mm. It was more a way of comparing you. So the student dashboard was designed to look at attendance, engagement, so that would be engagement with platforms like Canvas, but also engagement with the library, because the university can tell when you're in the library, because your little card has an RFID chip in it. There are RFID readers right when you walk into the library. You know, they usually go off if somebody tries to take a book out, and they haven't run it through the thing to take the books out, right? There's a little chip on those to say, you know, this has been stolen, ostensibly. Um, so, but that they, it basically works as a ticker. It knows when you're in the library. Time on campus, because the, li the whole campus is geofenced. So again, your RFID-enabled student card picks up, you know, there are sensors that pick up when you are here. And your results on all of these metrics were going to be displayed in a traffic light system. Green light if you're doing good. You know, if you come into lectures, come into seminars, go into the library, engage in the canvas. Orange light if you're letting it slip a bit. Red light if you're Josh. Um, <laughs> um, that is gamification. Applying the principles of doing all of these things are a game that you need achievements and scores at in order to do it. I I'm being gamified by a cost cutter, right? Because they, their coffee blows. Mm -hmm. right? It's dreadful. It's, it's markedly better than. I know it's enough to queue for a million years to get one in Blood Greg's, but it's terrible, right? But they've given me this card, which means if I drink nine of them, I get a free one. Yeah. And I will get the free one. You know, I, I, last week I went to a, I got a free one within a week last week, you know, because it was a whole thing. Um, that's gamification. The accrual of points for doing things. If you've got a Tesco Club card, yeah. you are being gamified. You are being encouraged to go and do this thing over and over again to get more points. That is the logic of a game, right? And then you get some rewards for it. You get like 30p off a bag of crisps or something, which I'm happy with, you know, because I like crisps. This logic is everywhere. It really is. We are gamified all the time. There are lots of things on our phones which gamify our behaviour to encourage us to engage with particular things, but there are loads of things in everyday life. And what I would argue is the entire education system has been gamified. You are right from the outset. When I was a kid, right, I didn't know what university was. Didn't occur to me. Didn't start thinking about things like that until I was like 14, 15, when like you said, well, in order to go to university, you probably need these grades in your GCSEs. So I was like, okay, well, right, I'm going to stop fucking around with school now and do some work. And I got those grades, and then I went to sixth form college, and I got A-levels, and I went to university, right? You guys went through an education system where you've been gamified all the way through. You had targets that you had to meet, mm -hmm. and you said, like, at this age, you've got to get a score. And then you can go on and do this. And then you've got to get another score at like 12, 13. And then you've got your GCSEs, and then you've got A-levels. And you've been here in university. Nobody gave a crap about grades when I was in university. It didn't matter. 
How could you care when you were barely sober enough to come to university most of the time? But you guys, right from the beginning, in fact, this is partially my fault, right? <laughs> I think I would have told you in MS100, like, if you don't get 2-1, you're fucked. <laughs> and your life's over. Um, sorry about that, but it's kind of true. Um, and so all the way through, and I know there's some real stress out in you, 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 you in particular, who's like, oh, I've got to get i got to get like 80, I got to melt that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the brain ooze, it's a whole thing. You as well. Um, <laughs> oh, there you've got the other, Josh don't care. <laughs> this genuinely going to give a shit. Um, that's gamification in action. Your education has been gamified here. You know you have to get those scores to get that outcome. It's a little bit conceptual what you're going to do with that outcome. Because I'm not sure, some of you have obviously a life plan, but it's a bit malleable. But you just want the top outcome, right? You want to complete the game with the best score you can. You want to get the, you know, the gold trophy, not the bronze trophy. Isn't this the case? Education is gamified. The whole logic of games infiltrates everything that you do in education all the way through. If you get this high score, you get to do that. If you get that score, <coughs> see ya, game over. So that logic flows through really, and it, it's not, I, I, I use education because obviously I work in education, I'm subjected to those rules. I am told, one of my KPIs as a lecturer is, how many of you get a good degree score? Like that's even in my control. You know, to, I can teach you stuff. Sure, I can give you information. I can provide an environment around you, but I can't do it for you. But I am told, like, you know, you need 60% of your students to get 2-1 or above. Your average mark for your module should be X. And if it's not, then you get pulled in for a meeting. I'm just like, get the, you know, I, it's MS 100 for Christ's sake. How am I supposed to get these morons to perform? Like, you know? um, so really gamification is an example of this movement away from that idea of the magic circle. The game logic infiltrates all parts of our lives. It is not discrete in the way that, these, uh, that we might think of. Do you think it's good? I mean, do you think this kind of system of gamification is good? Or? No, I think it's terrible. I agree with Ian Bogost, whose famous article on this, and this is the genuine title of the article, Gamification is Bullshit. But why is society accepted so much? Why? Because it makes us easier to control. Yeah. That if you have the logic of, we all need to achieve these things, it means the focus of people within those systems is on the achievement. That means you're easier to screw with. But people adapt to become that kind of person themselves. Absolutely. And they feel like they are getting rewarded on it. It's what I would call the live, laugh, love culture. <laughs> that you become so obsessed with the achievement of X, Y and Z that you forget that there's a culture outside that achievement. And therefore you have no culture. It is only what is given to you by the shops that you go to on a Saturday because that is what culture is for you because you have no engagement with anything outside of it. If all you are aiming to do is achieve the goals that you have been set, you will not be happy. Because guess what? You'll never achieve as well as other people. There's always something better than us. And two, there is no intrinsic value in those things that you will be asked to do. I would far prefer somebody to get a 2-1 low to one, but felt that they had enjoyed and learned something than somebody who gets a first but didn't enjoy. 